All right. Well, welcome everyone to another episode of Nutrition Secrets for Fighting COVID-19. And I'm Andrew Abbott, as many of you know, and uh, we're going to head straight into another episode here with our special guest, which is Rob Beaton. Hey, Rob, good to see you there. Welcome. Hey, how are you doing, Pastor Abbott? <laughs> doing great. Thank you very much. Yeah, we're so glad to have you on the air here and uh, ready to demonstrate once again another very nutritious and easy to prepare recipe, but full of goodness as well. And let me just shed a little light on, on Rob here. He's uh, been in the uh, chef business and well, more than that, actually baking and also educating for the past 40 years. Worked in the kitchen for a lot of that, but has also been a teacher as well. I understand Rob that you've been around the world and across the US teaching people and also uh, been a part of the culinary arts programs at Atlantic Union College and Weimar College. And uh, sure. yeah, a lot of great experience with communicating as well as with uh, just digging into some fresh goodness and some good bread and other products. So sounds awesome. And uh, I really liked your tagline there too, where you, you said you shouldn't have to pinch your nose in order to eat your meals. <laughs> right. Our food should be our medicine. But um, when I was very young, they used to give people cod liver oil because it would heal what ailed them and they would have to pinch their nose, throw it back. <laughs> that should not, our, our food should be our medicine, but not like that. It should be an enjoyable experience. Right. It should be full of healing, but also full of fresh joy and uh, tasty um, tastes as well. <laughs> um, and you do have a degree, as you mentioned, in baking and science technology. And it sounds like you've put it to good use in a lot of different contexts mm -hmm. and educated a lot of people. So I'm looking forward to what you have to present for us today, Rob. And looks like yeah. your ingredients are all spread out there and we can just dig right in. So please lead us into your recipe. Okay, well, I would like to, um, today we're, it's baking, we're going to teach about baking, and I'm going to have to um, slip away from what Lisa's done, because I know that you've had a little bit of a talk before, but we have to get this bread to rotting, otherwise the yeast works on its own timetable, time and if, if we can't mess with that, so I need to get that going. So I'm going to just jump ahead and do that, and then while the dough is rising, we'll get more of a chance to chat. So okay. Sounds good. Um, we have the dough in here, and um, what what has happened is I have soaked it overnight so that um, it doesn't look very good right now, but that's just the flour and the liquid. Um, okay. And so the reason why I did, well, I'll talk about why I did that a little. I just want to get it mixing. I'm going okay. to put that back on there. But because it only has the flour... And the liquids, which in this case is just water and applesauce, I need to put in the rest of the ingredient, which um, is yeast. So we're putting in yeast, a very critical component. There are four principal components that you need to make, flour, water, salt, and yeast. And of course, you don't even need yeast if you're making unleavened bread. Now, to scale. And the reason why I use this scale is because it's a lot more accurate, Pastor Abbott. Because um, when I used to teach at um, the culinary arts program, one of the first things I did was I would tell people about how beautiful the scale was. Because, and I would demonstrate that by giving everybody a cup and telling everybody, all the students, they got a cup and I had a bit of power and I said, give me seven cups of flour in that bowl. And so they would give me seven cups of flour in that bowl. And um, you know, not one of them weighed the same. Not a really? single one, they're all different. Because yeah. different people do it different ways. You know, some people, I'm trying to get both to work, there it is. No, that's not the right one. Um, Different people do it different ways because um, some people will put in the flour and they will have it heaping up a little bit. Of course, you probably know you shouldn't do that. You should take a knife and scrape it on, scrape it off like that. But sometimes 
if the flower has been sitting in the pot, it's compressed. All the air, you know, it shakes around and gets compressed, so it's a little bit more compact. Um, sometimes people fluff it up with a scoop. The second person, it's kind of aerated, so it's a little bit. So you'll get the same volume, but you'll get a different weight. But if you do it by weight, it's always the same. And the beautiful thing about weight is I can put this bowl on my scale and I don't have to get um, a spoon dirty with honey and then get another one for salt and then, and then get another one for the yeast. I do everything right in the bowl. So I'm going to zero this out and I'm going to put in my salt. So okay. now when I put in my salt, I went away from my yeast because yeast and salt are enemies. They don't like each other. So okay. I'm just going to put it in here and look at my scale. And that is enough salt. Now I just zero it out. So now it goes back to zero and now I can put in my honey. Of course, you'll be sending the recipes later, right? Uh -huh. That's right. Yeah, we'll, we'll uh, put this in the comments of our video here. So uh, everyone who tunes in can take a look at that and uh, see it for themselves, the ingredients, and how it works. Now this, this honey that I just liberally throw in here came to me with a lot of hard work. I don't know, there's not very much honey in there, but that's probably a couple of thousand trips for a bumblebee to make to the flower and back what I just did. Oh, and, you okay. know, if I put this in a measuring cup, and then I get a spoon and get it, try to get it all out. I'm still going to have some on the spoon. I'm still going to have some in the measuring cup. But with the scale, I use 100% of what that recipe calls for. There's none stuck in a cup or a spoon. So that's enough about scales. As you can tell, I like scales. Yeah. Well, that precision so, really helps, um, doesn't it? It just makes it very accurate. And if you're if you have a recipe you don't want people to know about, <laughs> you want to keep it a secret. Most people will be like, "Well, what's this 0. 0.63 honey, or what's this 0. 0.5 or whatever salt or whatever?" And they they know tablespoons, teaspoons, cups, pints, and quarts, but they don't know the percentage of a pound. We'll talk more about that later. So I'm going to go ahead and start this. It's going to get a little noisy. No worries. How, is that too noisy for you, Pastor Abbott? I, I actually can't pick it up so much with your uh, Bluetooth, so yeah, okay, it's good. not fine to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm just hearing I'm your voice. I'm gonna put a little water <laughs> in it. All right. Now this is hard to teach about the water, and this is where experience comes in of of knowing, understanding what it looks like, feels like, and tastes like. He says he can hardly hear it because of the so I'm going to come over and get our audience, and I want you to look in this bowl so okay. that you can see. Maybe you can get the camera, because otherwise she might get her right off the off the floor. <laughs> so she's kind of dancing around. So I've got my trusty assistant in here helping me. Okay. Well, so right you. now <laughs> it's kind of messy in there. Um, Huh. Because everything's got coming together. You can still hear me okay, Pastor yep. Abbott? Yeah, I can hear you fine. So I got a little bit, it's splashing it up on the side. Now, I, as I explained to you before, I just had the flour and the liquids in there, which is the flour, the applesauce, and all the water. And that soaked overnight. You can see now that mass is breaking, it, breaking apart. And you'll see it's just making a mess all over the sides of the bowl. Mm. Now, this is the um, development stage, not the development stage. This is the pickup stage where it's picking up all the ingredients that I just put in there. The water, I put in some honey, I put in some yeast and some salt. And mm. so all those, when I put in the water, everything broke apart. Now, when, I, when this is done... The size of that bowl, believe it or not, is going to be clean. It's going to be very clean so that you can't, it'll be like I almost washed the bowl. Mm. And at this point, the beginner baker will look in there and say, oh, no, I did it up. That's way too wet. But that's because the gluten 
is developing as it's mixing. And so we're just waiting for it to come back together and then it'll pull everything away from the sides of that bowl. Hmm. When, when baking, it's so important to know what the dough looks like and that just takes trial and error. Hmm. Um, this, what I want to teach you today is not about how never to make a mistake. I would like you to be able to minimize your mistakes, but um, I still make mistakes and I've been doing it for 40 years. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I want to be able to do the tool so that when a mistake happens, you can identify what that mistake is because most of the time, 90% of the solution is knowing what the problem was. And if you knew what the problem was, then you can fix it. And so that's what I want to do today. We're going to talk a little bit about the ingredients, why they're in there. We're going to talk a little bit about, now it's entering the cleanup stage. You can see it's cleaning up the size of the bowl. Um, it's still okay. kind of dirty around the top, and it may oh. not be able to clean all that up. You, you know, I was wondering uh, if, if Dave could bring it a little bit closer. Is that possible just so we can get a little better view of what's going on there? Dave, yeah, he wants to get a little closer. Yeah. Just to... Uh... Yeah, that okay. Looks, how's that pass it? Yeah, that's looking better. Yeah, the size of it, it's getting really clean. Now, uh -huh. the top is still kind of dirty because it can't really reach up there. We're in the cleanup stage, and a lot of rookie bakers would think that this is um, almost finished, but now we're going into the development stage, and that's where we're just developing the gluten. Mm -hmm. We want to get the gluten nice and strong because gluten is going to be like a balloon and mm. the yeast is going to be inside that balloon and the yeast is going to be eating sugar as it's eating sugar it's going to be generating gas mm. and so as it generates that gas it's filling up the balloon from the inside if the gluten was not strong enough it's like having a weak balloon and you're trying to put gas in a balloon with a hole in it it, mm. it just won't fill up and so we need to develop this gluten in and so it just takes um, like five or six minutes to do that. Oh, okay. Sounds good. Um, I just yeah. turned it up a little bit to try to speed up the process. So now the yeast is going to work and the, and, um, the honey is in there more for flavor, Pastor Abbott. It's not in there so much for to feed the yeast. Um, uh -huh. Just a quick science lesson, the, the yeast um, can eat three types of sugar, or that's its favorite, and it's um, glucose, sucrose, so this is fructose, this is honey, and that's what we put in there. So honey does a lot of things in there. It, um, sugar is hygroscopic, which means it grabs water out of the air and it and it holds it and so that's what it's going to do inside this bread so when it holds on to that moisture it, re it prevents it from sailing as quick hmm. um it also causes it to brown better the sugar goes through what they call the mallard browning effect and that causes it to brown better mm -hmm. and it it's also in there obviously for flavor i see so this mixer is working pretty hard because this is a this is not a whole wheat uh, bread. This is 50/50. It's got 50% whole wheat flour in it and 50% um, regular flour in it. So you could technically, by government standards, call this whole wheat bread. Oh, wheat okay. bread just has to have a little bit of wheat flour. It could be a teaspoon. That's uh -huh. why a lot of times in wheat bread you will see. Um, caramel coloring as one of the ingredients. Hmm. Gotcha. I'm gonna just stop this real quick to see if it's how it's doing, and okay. how I want to see. I want to see how the gluten is developed, whether it's good or not. Oh, so what I want to do is see how thin uh -huh. I can get this. Oh, okay. Uh, see could, that? Could, could you pause for just a second there, Rob? Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to to uh, stop you there, but um, I was just uh. Let me let me pause this for just a second here. Well, right. what I wanted what I wanted to share with you is we have to make sure that the gluten is developed 
when before you get it done. And how you do that is we just want to make sure that you can you want to see how thin you can get this. Now on regular white bread, you could get this so thin that I could lay it over my watch and I could tell you what time it is. It gets that wow. translucent. Can you see how thin it's getting there, Pastor Abbott? I can, yeah. I can see the light stream right through it, man. Yeah, so I can see bits of uh, wheat bran in here and wheat germ, and that's from the whole wheat. Huh. And so that's really thin. So that's telling me that this bread, this dough is ready for the next step, and that is proofing. Um, this is where some people err when they're first starting it. One thing I like, like about these boxes is I can totally cover this up. Hmm. And um, so now no air can get in there and dry it out. And that's very important to me. I want to take this off and get this dough out of here so that it can rise without this in it. I will just put this over here. And now I'm going to put this back on. So it can just hang out here. And what's going to happen is the yeast, is what us bakers call, is in the lag phase. And what that means is that, I don't know if you've ever seen these commercials of people waking up in the morning and they're just like, <sighs> that's what the lag phase is. That's, they're, it's just waking up. And it's, um, it's moving very slowly and it's a little confused because mm -hmm. the yeast, and I use instant yeast. Now there's, um, uh, when I was growing up, we used active dry yeast. But with the advent of these bread machines that happened about 20 years ago, we started using instant yeast. And the difference between the two is active dry you always had to get a little bit and pour it in a cup, mm -hmm. add a little bit of warm water. And if, you, if the water was too warm, it would kill the yeast. Some bakers like to put a little sugar in there to help the, give the yeast something to eat. And mm -hmm. then they would wait seven to 10 minutes and it would bubble and it would gurgle and it would smell really bad. Mm -hmm. And then after the 10 minutes, after you reactivated the yeast, then you would scrape that out and you put it right into there and then that would be your yeast. This bypasses all of that. You don't have to reactivate it. You simply, like I did earlier, you just dump it in there and then the yeast starts, um, when it gets hydrated, when the rest of the dough gets hydrated or when you add the water, then it wakes up. And that's what it's doing now. So it's waking up and it's looking around for food. It's hungry because it's been, in, in this stage, it's kind of in a coma stage. And, and so you wake it up, and the first thing it does is like, food. Where's the food? Wow, so, that's pretty cool. <laughs> it's almost like so, a BBC nature program where it's out and about prowling, right? <laughs> yeah. Sure seems that way. <laughs> so, so what's happening is it's um, the wheat is... 75 to 78% starch. That's what we, that's where we get our carbohydrates from, is from that starch. Well, that starch is converting into glucose, the preferred food for yeast. If I was to give a little yeast psycho, which is so small you can't even see them, and I was to give it a little plate of glucose and a little plate of sucrose, which is regular table sugar, or a little plate of fructose, it would always go for the simplest sugar first, and that would be glucose. That's the okay. simplest sugar. That's what it prefers. If there is no glucose, it will eat sucrose. If there's no sucrose, it will eat fructose. So the wheat supplies all of the sugar that you need. You don't need to add any sugar to your dough. We did it because we like the flavor. But uh, those other reasons that I mentioned earlier, it retains the moisture, um, prevents, not prevents, but it retards staling, and it helps it to brown better. It gives it a more even color. Mm -hmm. Now, 
Um, I think Lisa talked to you a little bit last week about how this is um, a mother dough for me. So I will use this one dough to make the pizza crust, hmm. the dinner roll, the danishes, and a loaf of bread. So that one does all, and, and um, this is pretty common in bakeries. I mean, they don't make, when they make raisin bread, they don't make a brand new dough. They just take the same dough and they add some more cinnamon, some more sugar, some raisins, maybe some dates and pecans or whatever they want to add to whatever their, you know, distinctive secret formula is. They'll put that in there. And when they make seven grain bread, then they'll add those other ingredients that'll make it distinctively seven grain or whatever. And mm -hmm. so that's what I've adopted here. Um, so um, we've talked about the yeast. This is one of the primary things. You know, yeast is mentioned a lot in the Bible. Jesus mm -hmm. said, be careful of the leaven of the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. So yeast is sometimes referred to as a good thing because you want to have the yeast of Jesus so that righteousness will bloom up inside of you. Yeast mm -hmm. continues to grow and grow and grow. I can tell you lots of stories about that, but we mm -hmm. don't have time. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the flour in here. That's the principal component in here. All right. There's all types of different flours. Um, and you, can't, you cannot just use any flour to make bread. Bread flour has to be strong. It has to be um, most people don't know it, but it's, it has to be 13 or 14 percent protein. But you don't need to know that. You just need to go make sure that if you're making bread, you want to get flour for bread making. And it'll say bread flour on there. And you don't want to bring that stuff home and make a plate of chocolate chip cookies with it because they will be little hockey pucks. They will be very hard. Ooh. The reason this was a very tough thing to do to this flour to mix it like this for this five or seven minutes that I mixed it it beats up the flour so it has to be strong to withstand that um, so there's three different parts of the flour three major differences in the in the wheat berry there's the there's the uh, if you can see a wheat a little wheat kernel normally I draw this on a board but you have the outside that covers it would be the bran you would have the germ, which is located on the bottom. That's the brain of the wheat grain. That's what tells it when conditions are right to shoot down a root and to shoot up a sprout. That's where the brains are in the germ. Interesting. And um, then there's the inside that's called the endosperm. And that's basically all starch. That's 75 to 78% of that wheat kernel is starch. So, um, Wheat berries start off with about 25 to 28 vitamins and minerals. Most of that's contained in the germ. Probably 25 minerals, nutrients, and, and vitamins are contained in that germ. Mm -hmm. There's hardly any in the bran. There's mm -hmm. hardly any in the endosperm. Mm -hmm. um, when they first, when um, our women back at World War II time, started the men were off fighting the war and the women went to the factories to support that war effort they started making um bread in 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 bakeries in mass because up until that time mom made it at home hmm. but when women went and helped the war effort by working at home they um bakers started doing it and what they noticed was that bread uh, was browner when you included the wheat germ. You can see my slices of bread here. Hmm. It's pretty tan color. Hmm. And that's because I used the whole wheat. So they noticed that they, if they remove the bran, they would get something more like the color of this. Oh, goodness. <laughs> and so that's people would say, wow, I want, that looks cleaner, that looks whiter, that looks pure, I want that. <laughs> so in, when they took off the bran, the germ came with it. So they were left, they went, they took the germ off, they took off the, um, the bran, and so they were left with maybe three vitamins and minerals, that was it. Oh. 
So then they found out another incredible thing was that if they bleached it, it would make it even whiter still. <laughs> and so wow. if people were looking at two loaves of bread and they go, oh, I want that whiter one. That would be better because it's whiter. <laughs> well, what do you think that happened, Pastor Abbott, when they bleached it to the rest of those vitamins and minerals? Uh, it probably got depleted even more. It just take it, it was out, down right? to zero. Oh my it word! It was down to zero. Wow! And so, <laughs> um, what happened was is that people could actually starve to death and eat all the bread that they wanted, and they would mm. still starve to death because there was no nutrient in it. And so, uh -huh. as food is defined in the dictionary by anything that can have nutrient value to the body, and bread at that time was not considered food because it didn't have any nutrients in it. So huh. the government stepped in and they said, well, we will um, we'll enrich it. Only the government can take out 28, put back in eight, because they mandated eight has to go in. And then in the early 2000s, they mandated that folic acid go in it as well. Hmm. And so then they went up to nine. So they took out 28, 25, and then they put back in nine. And they say that's enriched flour. So that's a little bit about the flour. When you're making bread, you have to make sure that you get whole wheat bread for flour, not pastry flour, not a cake flour. There's all kinds of different flours. Hmm. So you want to get this type. Um, so we've talked about flour. We talked about yeast. Um, what else is in here, Pastor Abbott, that we could talk about? Well, you mentioned the gluten, but I don't know. That's probably part of the flour, right? The gluten comes with the flour. Uh -huh. The water. The, the next, water, probably yes. the next largest component thing in here is water. Okay. Water is very important. Um, bread making loves hard water. Um, I don't know what type of flour, what type of water comes out of your faucet. Normally, I just use it out of the, the, the um, faucet. But you can get all different types of um, water from different mun municipalities. But you don't want to use bottled water for your bread because okay. bottled water a lot of times has been filtered, it's been softened by salt and other things, and it takes it takes out all the minerals and stuff that the yeast requires to grow. So um, usually, if you're on groundwater or well water, that's probably some of the best because that's normally always going to be hard because you're going to get different minerals and 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 things from the ground. Um, probably the worst from outside like this is snow melt because that's like distilled water if you get snow that's just coming out of the atmosphere um, that would be like getting bottled water hmm. um, soft or distilled water is excellent for steaming your vegetables it will keep all your vitamins and minerals intact you don't want to use hard water for doing that but in your bread it's not your friend um, hmm. if you are having a challenge making bread at home you might want to contact wherever you get your water from and say how hard is it and and if anybody has a question they can contact me and I can give you the specifics on water but another important thing that water does is it controls the temperature of this how are we doing on time am I talking too much oh no you're doing fine yeah okay, yeah good. take as much time um, as you need <laughs> yeah it controls the temperature of the the dough um so in the winter time, I typically warm up my water because when my dough is finished, when it's done mixing, mm -hmm. ideally I want it about 78, 80 degrees. Any hotter than that, that my dough is fevered and tempered and I have to move very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, they do this intentionally sometimes in bakeries. They're, they're like, oh no, we just got another order for 500 more loaves of bread. We need to kick up, um, make 500 more loaves, and they will heat it up, and that will um, make the process go a lot faster. But when you make, when you speed up that process, then you lose fermentation flavor, and that's what people desire when they bite into a loaf of bread. You want that fermentation flavor, mm. and so speeding things up too fast, yes, you can get your loaf of bread done faster, but you will sacrifice flavor to do that. In the summer. Most bakeries that I've ever worked at are not air conditioned. You are mm -hmm. slave to whatever it is outside. 
and you know i've baked in southern california i've baked in texas i've baked in oklahoma i've baked in florida and um in the summer it gets quite hot it gets quite humid and that would i would sacrifice flavor if i could not slow down the process how do i do that i do that with the water so what i'll do is i'll figure out okay well i need a there's a there's a formula that you could plug in so you can say i want my finished product could be 78 degrees. So you take the temperature of your flour, you take a temperature of your water, you take a temperature of your mixer. How long is it going to mix? Figure out a friction factor. Um, and then you can, and you'll say, okay, well, I'm going to put in, and say it's, I don't know, you're, you're going to put in 14 pounds of water. Seven pounds of that needs to be in ice and the other seven pounds in water. That way, when it gets done mixing, I will be at 78 degrees. Wow, because that's it's, real science. It, it, it is a science. <laughs> um, and I'm better at the science aspect of it. Lisa's is better at um, the artistic part. When it comes to uh, baking science and art, I'm the scientist and Lisa's the artist. She can make beautiful things like that. Wow, that's um, great. So that's what water does. It controls the temperature. So we've talked about, we've talked about um, flour. We talked about yeast. We talked about water. So there's only two more ingredients in here, and then I'm going to probably preemptively jump to the next step of forming this dough because I think that's what people want to want to mm. see. Yeah. Um, I try to use um, different types of salt, and and for those of you who are connoisseurs and like to spend time in the kitchen, you know that there's all kinds of different types of salt out there. But I like to get rock salt from wherever they come from. This is Himalayan pink salt, as most of your viewers probably know, but you can get black salt. You can get um, all kinds of different salts. I wouldn't get the infused salt. They're just putting other flavors in there. But um, the stuff naturally from wherever it came from, that's what I like to use because there's all kinds of micronutrients and mm. other nutritional aspects that are really good that comes with the salt. So what does the salt do? Why do I need it? Number one answer, flavor. Mm. Um, it, it adds flavor. Another thing that it does is we talked about earlier when I put the salt in, I said I don't want it to touch the yeast because salt and yeast are enemies. This <laughs> will kill this on contact. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> so in its dry state, if I was to sprinkle a little yeast out here, and then put a little salt on here, probably wouldn't do much. Uh -huh. It's not gonna hurt it. But once I add water, then this salt will immediately kill all this. Oh so what wow. salt does in here is it controls the growth. So if I didn't put salt in here, I would see this dough really rising fast. And it would be when I put it in the oven, it would almost be, I don't know if you ever cooked a souffle, but that's a egg concoction and it's uh -huh. aerated by just whipping it and then you bake it. And if you have any loud noises, if you have any loud clangs or somebody stomping their feet, it will make that whole creation just And wow. this will be very fragile like that without salt. Salt toughens the gluten that's in the flour, but it also controls the growth of the yeast so that it keeps it under control. So in here, the salt is evenly mixed in, and so it's controlling that yeast as it grows up, but not killing it. Another thing that um, you probably already know, but maybe don't realize it as we put it into different ingredients, is a preservative. Mm -hmm. You know, you get processed meats like any anything that goes on a sandwich, like roast beef or ham or anything that is loaded with salt. Why? Because it's a preservative. It cures it. It it prevents it from rotting quickly. So it does the same thing in here. It preserves it. It kills microorganisms like yeast and other fungus and stuff that's growing that's growing around. So it kills those things. It um it does a number of other things, but those are the principal things of why we add salt. You just have to remember that in direct contact, it kills you. So if you're, especially if you've got one of those, uh, 
making your stuff all in one where you put in all the ingredients to close the lid and then you come back later and you got a loaf of bread. <laughs> you do not want to put in the yeast. Usually they will tell you and they're very specific. You put in the flour then you put in the, well, you put in the water first, then you put the flour on top of that. You put the yeast on top of that. You may put some sugar on top of that. You may put some vital wheat gluten on top of that. And then you put on the salt last. That way they have a barrier between the salt and the yeast. They're very specific when you do those recipes in that bread machine that the yeast not touch the salt because sometimes they have that on a delayed start. And then um, by the time, say you set it at 6 p.m. the night before and you want fresh baked bread when you get up in the morning, mm -hmm. it, will not, it will be a fresh baked brick if the salt is on top of the yeast when you put those things together because the salt will have killed the yeast before it even starts. I see. So, wow. Um, That's so cool. It's, it's cool how there's like a balance there to, in order to have it, the substance that you need, but also the lightness and fluffiness that you want too. It's, that's awesome. <laughs> right. Yeah. The, and it's all about ratios. And that's, that's what, you know, if you were to be in a, a baker's apprentice, I'd be teaching you the ratios of, so it doesn't matter if you're making 500 loaves of bread or two loaves of bread. There's only, a, it, the yeast is always 2% based on flour and the honey is about 7%. And, um, so we teach those ratios. The other thing that we put in there that we don't really need, and I talked about that a little bit earlier, is the fructose. And, and I talked about some of those qualities of why we put that in there. Basically, number one is flavor. We don't need it because the yeast needs it. A lot of people think, well, you got to have it in there because otherwise the yeast has nothing to eat. Mm -hmm. We've already learned that the yeast, there's plenty enough sugar in that starch for this to be, so we don't need this. So um, the honey uh, for flavor, but also for browning, um, for um, moisture retention so that it retards sealing. That's why you put it in there. And there's other things that you can put in there. Oh, another thing that I put in here, because um, I, like, I like simple ingredients. I like things that either have one syllable or maybe two. Yeast, water, salt, honey. One thing that I did put in there that is a multi-syllable word, because I don't like like monosodium glutamate, mm -hmm. and I, I don't like uh, ammonia sulfate. I mean, all these different things that they put in for preservatives and stuff. Mm -hmm. Another thing that is a multi-syllable word, applesauce. Now, a lot of people put oil in their bread. I don't in mine because I don't think that you really need it. But what oil does is it also retains moisture. Hmm. And it also helps it in the browning. It also gives it a certain mouthfeel. Oil, when you are used to eating with oil, it has a certain mouthfeel that people find pleasant. And that's a very important part of our eating and the, not only the taste, but it's the texture. And so that's what oil does. It gives it a pleasant mouthfeel. So I, instead of putting oil in here, I have put applesauce in here. It also holds on to moisture, not quite the same as oil does, but I just think it's a lot better for you in the bread. However, in my danishes, as you will see, there is some oil in one of the ingredients in there. Um, huh. So I am, this, this bread, one of the things about, oh, let me, let me just bounce real bit, quick back to the flour. I'm gonna flip this over and let them come, come out. <clears throat> um, I had soaked this flour overnight, Pastor Abbott. I had actually put the flour and the water together last night and the applesauce i put in there oh okay the reason why i did that is we've talked about the yeast and how it has three different basic components the endosperm the um the bran and the germ and so the bran is very coarse uh -huh. and um that's why we need it in our body because it cleans out our gi tract that's why we want it but in being coarse, it, um, it's also coarse. Remember we talked about the gluten and how it makes all these little balloons. 
if you take a really close look at this loaf of bread, you can, I don't, you probably can't see it, but there's little tiny holes all over there. And you can see each one of those holes is a, where a yeast zygote was, and there was a, um, a balloon around it, if you will. Hmm. So if you can imagine this brand, it's like, a, like if I bought a sponge, a dry sponge from the local supermarket and brought it home, it would be very coarse and scratchy hmm. until I got it wet. Uh -huh. And when I got it wet, it would become soft. And when uh -huh. I squeezed the water out of it, it would become absorbent and suck up more water. So that's exactly what I did. I, I know that this brand in here is like that dry, scratchy sponge. Hmm. And so what I wanted to do with it is I wanted it to be wet. I, I wanted to soften it up so it wouldn't be so coarse. Because hmm. what happens is you've got all these little balloons that are forming with hundreds of thousands, probably millions of little balloons forming. And the brand comes by and it splices a hole in it. So you got this yeast zygote in here generating gas, but it cannot fill up a balloon with a hole in it. And so uh, bakers in the early 1900s, they just didn't like to make whole wheat bread because it was always denser. It was always not as um, lofty and high mm -hmm. as white bread was because of that brand. They didn't like the brand and it caused some other challenges for them too. But um, what, what, we did was we soften up that brand so that it went as it goes by the the little balloon it will not cut a hole into it so yeah. you will generally see if you soak your fat flour a 25 percent increase in the volume of your loaves of bread just by soaking the flour for at least two hours and you can do it overnight wow the That's challenge so <laughs> with going overnight is you don't have um, you can't control the temperature as much. So, mm -hmm. you know, um, it's rainy right now. It's kind of wintry here, probably outside ambient temperature in the mid to upper 50s, maybe the lower 60s. It's an excellent day to stay inside and make bread because our humidity is way up today. And um, bread loves humidity. Um, this is still a little sticky, and I'm probably rushing this a bit. But it's only because we are on TV. Can you see everything okay? Yeah, I can see it real well. Yeah. It's like a yeah, a good oh, theater um, for an eating there. <laughs> yeah, I'm so, learning here. This is amazing. <laughs> so this is I'm I'm rushing it because um we're very time sensitive here and it's challenging to take a four hour process and condense it to thirty minutes. So um, what we have here is that when we soak it overnight, I kind of lose the control of the temperature aspect. Like if I was making it today, because it is a little cooler, I probably would have started this with 80 or 90 degree water. And I did last night, but then, you know, overnight in my home, it probably dropped down into the 60s because we don't turn on the heater at night. And so this took on that temperature. And then I went to work this morning, and so it's been out in my car, which was out in a parking garage at the Providence Hospital where I work. And, be, and so it's probably closer to about 50, upper 50s, low 60s. This is very cool for bread. So that's not impossible to overcome. It's just going to require more time, and I just don't have more time. So I'm kind of rushing it. If it was normally 55 degrees, or 60 degrees, I would probably let this thing rise in that bowl for probably two hours. Okay. And I would put it in a warm place, like over by my stove. I'd put it up on top of the refrigerator. Back in, back 40 years ago, the refrigerator was a warm place up on top. Hmm. But now they're so efficient that they're not as warm as they used to be. Hmm. So now I'm going to get out of my trusty scale again, and I'm going to divide this up. And it's going to be a, a somewhat sticky, and that's okay. So I'm going to go to get some flour. Mrs. Randall, a.k.a. Lisa, showed me where I can get some flour. Okay. It's somewhere in here. Yeah, no worries. Because she mills her own. 
<laughs> and so because this is gonna be a little sticky, I got a little flower here. All right, there you go. So it's good to coat your hands with it. Now, um, this loaf of bread here, you probably can't see it over here. He weighed 20 ounces when I, when I started out. Now, when I got done with him, he probably weighed 18 ounces. Because in fermentation, so I'm gonna put, I'm looking for 20 ounces on here. That's 15, which is almost a pound. That's one pound, four ounces. Okay, so that's one pound, 1.2. Oh, that's a little too much. And you can see how accurate the scale is so that everything is going to be exactly the same. So that's going to be my loaf of bread right there. Right. Now my pizza. Compact now. Yeah. yeah, it looks fairly like compact. Pizza, oh. That's nice. Yeah is um, he was only 12 ounces or 0.75% of a pound. Now you can buy these scales at Walmart for like 20 bucks. This one actually oh. came with our Vitamixer. It's incredible what they've done with the Vitamixer um, and their scales. So now I'm gonna make my danishes. I think I used about a pound of that. And then the rest of this will be for my dinner rolls. Mm. So, um, I know that probably all of your, all of our people that are watching this want to see recipes. They want to know how this is made. Mm -hmm. But I am here to tell you that um, recipes are a dime a dozen. Mm -hmm. It, um, I want to, what I'm doing now is I'm putting this in a nice, even shape. I want this, and it's a little stickier than I like it, and that's because I'm rushing it. Mm -hmm. but I want to get this weight evenly distributed, because you can only imagine, if I try to make a loaf of bread like this, mm -hmm. out of this, then it, the weight is not evenly distributed, because I need, um, I want it all to be, homogenous. Now, inside this, the yeast has been working, and it's been um, growing, and what we're doing here is a couple of things, Pastor, mm -hmm. is um, we've got these huge colonies of yeast that are in their little own little community, mm -hmm. and they're not really evenly distributed. So I'm breaking up these families and I'm telling them that they need to move around a little bit. Also what they've done is um, the yeast zygote is inside this um, balloon. And as he continues to make gas, the food gets out of his reach and he can't eat it anymore. And okay. so what I'm doing is I am destroying all these large bubbles that are formed inside. And I am bringing the food back into the reach of the yeast zygote again, so it continues to eat. So I've broken up the families, and now they are forming new families, and they're going to start um, and evenly distributing the yeast throughout the whole mass of the dough. And then I'm um, making sure that um, they have something to eat. I see. Wow, it's like you're a little Usually drama going on in there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Usually it doesn't stick to my hands this bad, but it's because it's so sticky. Uh -huh. Because I'm I'm rushing. You normally my hands would not look like that when I'm done. Gotcha. So now we're gonna let it rise again. We need it so right so what I did there was I, I figured out my final weight. I wanted to know the weight of this, so I uh, so that's the final weight. So I got the scale over here, and I cut everything into its final weight, and then I put everything evenly together, distributing the yeast and eliminating the big holes that were inside. 
The next step in the process is it's going to rest here for a little while, and then it's going to, then I'm going to put it, it, it I'm going to put it in its final shape, so that um, the dinner roll is going to look something like that when I get done, and the danishes are going to look something like that when I get done, and then it's going to rise again. Now. Um, I, I learned in baking school there at the campuses of K-State in Manhattan, Kansas, um, was a good baker. We asked, what defines a good baker? And you would think, you know, everybody has their own ideas of a good baker. Mm -hmm. But I was told, and, and I, because I have baked all over the United States and the world, is that the best baker can make what the customer wants. Mm -hmm. That makes sense, right? <laughs> if yeah. I can make what you want, then that makes me a pretty good baker. And yeah. what people want is different in Texas than in Washington, than in Georgia, than in Romania, than in Africa, than in, you know, and if I can adapt my skills to where I'm at, then that would make me a pretty good baker. For instance, um, somebody said to me, you know, my grandma, may she rest in peace, she always made bread and it had these large holes inside of it. And when we toasted it, it would capture the butter in there and the jelly. And then we would just get this big surprise and we'd bite into it. And, and that just, can you do a loaf of bread like that? Because that would remind me of my grandma. I'd mm -hmm. say, sure. I would, instead of letting it rise three times because I let it rise in the bowl, then I cut it, I'm going to let it rise again. Then I'm going to cut it into the different, um, mold it into its different shapes. And then I'm going to put it into a pan and let it rise one more time. I would eliminate one of those rises and let the holes get nice and big on the inside. Hmm. And then with one less rise, I, I would have larger holes in there. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> and likewise, somebody else could say, you know, I grew up on Wonder Day bread. And those, it was, I never, that, who would make a loaf of bread with large holes in it? That's not a good loaf of bread. Yeah. I want it with nice, even, consistently concentric holes, evenly distributed through that whole slice of bread. That would be a good loaf of bread. Sure, I can do that. So instead of three rises, I may do four rises. And that way I know, because every time I do it, the holes get a little bit smaller and they get more evenly distributed. And so it's just understanding what you're doing, why you're doing it, so that I can't eliminate every future problem that you may have in the bakery, but you can hopefully identify where the problem comes from. Yeah. So just because of the lack of time, because normally I would let this sit for a, a while longer, I'm going to go, go ahead into the next step. And I don't know how this is going to go because it is so wet. Um, I'll first show you the bread, and I'm going to get some more flour over here. I know it's probably nerve-wracking to see me go off the screen. But <laughs> as long as we can hear you. <laughs> uh, Lisa has ground all this flour. She has her own flour mill in wow. her home. And I'm a baker, and I don't have my own flour mill at home. <laughs> but um, Lisa is gluten intolerant, but she oh. is a wonderful baker. She makes some of the best bread. She doesn't use the scale like I do. She just, Lisa's a dump cook. She just mm -hmm. dumps things in there and it comes out excellent. Wow. And uh, I'm somewhat of a dump cook as well, but I, I do like my scale. Uh, but she just, she just knows by the feel and texture because she's been doing it so much. It must be torture for her because she can't eat it. Mm. But she gives it to her husband, and when she worked for, when we worked together at Upper Columbia Academy, she would make it for all the students and faculty and staff there. Wow. So um, I'm going to put this loaf of bread in there, and what I'm doing, and let me just tell you, I'm doing the same thing that I did before, mm -hmm. except this time I'm going to end up in the final shape. So how you end up with the final shape, that's good. Um, but, you know, everybody, you know, if you learn from your mother and your grandmother how to do this process differently, and it turns out good, then good. This mm -hmm. is the way I learned. In fact, 
when I'm in a in a bakery that's doing hundreds, sometimes thousands of loaves of bread, we never touch the dough. So really, doing uh, uh, Lisa's more skilled at this part than I am, because I usually let the machine do it. So again, I'm moving that yeast around. I'm distributing the um, the large holes, making them smaller holes. I'm bringing the food back into the reach of the of the um, the yeast cycle, so he can eat. Right. So yeah. I just rolled it up, and at every step, I'm smashing the air out of it. Uh -huh. And then I'm going to finally pinch it right here, get my uh, loaf pan right here, and he's going to go. There's a seam at the bottom, and he, that yeah. seam's going to go at the bottom of, of the loaf. So you want that at the bottom, so you don't see that. Right. And yeah. then <clears throat> he is going to sit over here, probably with a cloth towel over him. Like I said, rainy days are a good day to make bread because you can't go outside anyways. Well, I guess you can, but um, the humidity is really high today. And so I would still cover it, get a damp towel and cover it and try to keep it in a warm spot. So that is the loaf of bread. So the pizza, now you can see I didn't make the, uh, I didn't put all the toppings on the, on the, uh, pizza there and the reason why I didn't do that is because you can actually freeze these things you can freeze them you can make like four or five of these and you can put them in your freezer awesome. and and what I do is I bake it just all I'm doing when I bake this is I just want to kill the yeast that's all I want to do I don't want to brown it I don't want to uh, give it like a crusty, crispy crust. I just want to kill the yeast. So it's only in there just to get the temperature of that whole mass up above about 120 degrees. When I do that, all the yeast is dead. Hmm. So Maybe. what I'm going to do here is I'm going to roll this out just a little bit. Uh-oh. He's stuck to my rolling pin. Hmm. Now, um, normally when I roll that loaf of bread, I don't need flour on my bench. That's what I call this when I'm, you know, working. Uh -huh. uh, this is called a bench. And, um, and I normally don't have my hands covered like this. But it's because I'm rushing things. So now, like in Chicago, you got to do, I don't know how much you can see. Can you see up here? Yeah, I can see the lights there. Yeah. Okay, well. Chicago, in Chicago, you know, it's all about hand toss dough. So you got to hand toss it to make it taste better, right? <laughs> so we're going to hand toss that. Now, when you hand toss, a key, a key secret is you don't want to catch it with your fingers. Fingers poke holes in it. So you just want to do everything on your fist. So I'm going to keep this hand kind of static, and I'm going to throw it so that this one makes the pizza swirl. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I want it to get bigger in circumference because I could probably roll it out it's stuck to fit this, but it's so much funner to throw it. I hope <laughs> I don't mess yeah. up Lisa's kitchen. Oh, I'm going to throw flour this. everywhere. <laughs> Whoa, there we go. So now, <laughs> it, it should be the size. Now, they have a pizza throwing contest, believe it or not. They have pizza <laughs> it, shows. It's like how high they can throw it, typically? <laughs> Yeah, you can look it up on YouTube, but these guys are throwing it, and they catch it. They're doing two at a time, and they're throwing them up, catching. They'll catch it, and it'll roll down their arm. They'll snag it with this, and then throw it. It's amazing. Whoa. I don't do that. <laughs> so this is, wow. right now, it's not actually a pizza crust. Uh -huh. It is a pita bread. You know, I put this in the, temp in the oven at a very high temperature, like 450 degrees, 475. And it will actually separate the blister and I'll get this big bubble. So prevent that from happening because I want a pizza. I don't want a pita. I put these holes all over it. Oh, I see. You can do this with a fork or, you know, they have uh, what they call dockers. And it's a little roller thing with these little spines and you can roll that. It also works as a good um, back massager. But you can see here, I use the fork at home to get all these holes in it. 
I see. So that's the pizza. So now we're going to do these danishes. How are we doing on time? Am I way over the time? I think I'm way over the time. <laughs> I'm enjoying this, Rob. So yeah, no worries. Just keep going until you're done. Yeah, we're fine. <laughs> okay, we're almost done. I don't want to bore our, bore our audience. Oh, this is very fascinating. There's so much science behind this that I just never realized was there. That's amazing. I'm going to make this about as thin as I can to make these danishes here. Okay. I'm going to try to make it square as I can too, because I have to cut them. It's starting to stick a little bit to the table. That's why it's not, it's not um, going out as square as I'd like it. Mm -hmm. Plus I'm in a little bit of a hurry. So now I'm gonna take my dough knife, which is one of my better friends in the bakery. And this one's got um, little ink, um, inch marks on it. So it goes up to five inches wide. I'm gonna do this four inches. Where is my, I know I had it, my pizza cutter. There you go. <laughs> so I'm gonna do this by four inches. So here's four right here, so I know that's four. And it shrinks back because I stretched it. So there's four, so I'm gonna do that. And I'm gonna go, because I want it square. There's four there. And there's four there. There's four. Now, um, got to be able to cut in a straight line. And you can see it shrinks back, so I'm not going to have quite four. Now these are not going to work over here, and this is not going to work here. That one may work. So he can go in the pile for my dinner rolls later. Hmm. That'll be right there. So now um, I'm going to make these danishes. Now this is a tofu danish cream, and this is the one that has oil in it. I blended this. I just put all the ingredients together in my Vita mixer. Uh -huh. And then I blend it until it's creamy smooth. Um, there is a little bit of flour in it, and um, I do that to thicken it. So I do have to thicken this on the stove for a little bit. I see. Now, so is this, is this the I one like, where you have the? Oh, sorry, is this the one where I got the recipe uh, that you gave me? The recipe is for uh -huh. the Danish cream. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Just want to let everyone know yeah, that. So, Pop it in the comments. So, yeah. When I when I do this. I'm going, I always like to have contrasting colors. So I've got red and yellow here today. So this is a, this is a nice strawberry rhubarb. So um, this is just rhubarb, strawberries, and some sucanat. And then um, um, a little bit of cornstarch to thicken it. So we'll just put a little bit on there like that. Oh man, you're making my mouth water there, Rob. <laughs> That looks good. Yeah, uh, we're going to have to eat these before they get bad. Uh, so I wish, you know, that you could be here with me to help sample them. Oh, that'd be awesome. <laughs> so, so now this one is mango. Mm. So I just went uh, to Winco and I got a can of diced mangoes. And then I, it, it came already packed in its own juice, natural juice. And then I thickened it. Now, if you want it to be a little sweeter, you can use like apple juice, which is kind of clear, and you can do it that way. Um, so let me just do a couple of these. And it's sticking to the table, so that kind of distorts it. I'm going to just bring the four corners together, Pastor. Squeeze it underneath like this. And then you pull it apart a little bit like petals of a flower. Hmm. The mango one is going to be like this. My um, 
grandkids are going to be very happy about this cooking class today. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, you just you just pull the four corners together like that. I see. That's great. That's very artistic. Man. <laughs> like under, underneath the top, and then you kind of pull it apart a little bit, like the flowers of a petal. Okay, so I'm going to do the rest of that after we get off screen because I would like to really quickly show you these dinner rolls. Okay. So this is too big to be a dinner roll, but you know your 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 imagination is your only limitation. So I, um, I took off. This is probably about a one ounce piece, and this is the simple one. I'm just, again, I'm just moving the yeast around. I'm um, making those big holes, small holes, and I'm bringing the food back into the reach of the, so there's a dinner roll, it's just simple mm -hmm. like that. Now, I put these in a muffin pan, and so I put three, probably about a third of an ounce piece, that way when they came together, and that way this pulls apart really easy when you warm it up. Or you could just go with two, two of those balls, and you can do that. Or th you can do two, and then you can stick one ball in some poppy seed, one ball into some sesame seeds, and then you got that effect. Mm. So it's, it's like I said, it's, it's, and there's all kinds of ideas that you can do on oh. Oh. the internet. <laughs> And these are about one ounce pieces. So I'm going to take this and make this go together. And I'm going to hold one and swirl the other. Oh, whoa. <laughs> That's and beautiful. And then you kind of just wrap it around. You put it together. And then you put this inside of a muffin pan. And you <laughs> will get something like this when you're done. Wow. <laughs> Uh, it looks like a jewel of bread there. That's cool. <laughs> if you don't want to do two, you can just do one, fold it in half, do the same thing, uh -huh. and then twirl that around. That's awesome. Like that. And that wow. is Baking 101. <laughs> well, that's awesome, Rob. Man, I just love the tastes and the scenes of that and the beauty behind the bread too and i had no idea that there was so much science and art behind a good loaf of bread that's just uh yeah i was fascinated all the way through so thank you so much good, good. and uh yeah like i said i'll make sure to have those recipes there in the comments of the video here and uh one thing i think would be cool too is if we had um some folks who've been listening here if they'd be willing to share some of their own stories of bread baking to me if they took one of those recipes and tried it out Feel free to share with us in the comments what your experience was and uh, just uh, any other insights that you have about baking too. We can kind of start a little community discussion here and uh, yeah, I'd love to have you on the air that. too. Yeah. If there's any questions or anything, like if, if something doesn't turn out, um, is there a way to contact me or Lisa so that we can answer those questions? Yeah, for sure. Well, uh, a comment in the comments there would work great. And then I can get in, okay. get in touch with Rob or uh, whoever is uh, commenting would like some more info. I can just, uh, I can be the conduit right. there. <laughs> and uh, right. yeah, we'll get you. you in touch. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Well, thanks so much, Rob. Right. We'll sign off Happy here. Baking. Thank you so much. Yeah. Same to you and God bless. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.